Okay, welcome to Brain and Behavior, or Biology and Behavior, also called Neuroscience and Biological Psychology. There's quite a bit of names for this uh, particular section, but um, we're going to talk about it. The brain is uh, the most complex organ uh, to talk about, to um, explain, and also to understand, but you're going to get a pretty decent bite-sized understanding of what brain and behavior is when it comes to psychology and how it focuses on um, well the brain and the nervous system so my question to you is can you live with half a brain and I want you to think about that as we progress and uh, that answer to the question is in this slideshow um, but think about that for a second can you live with half of a brain what do you think Now, there are two supporting systems that we, we can talk about here. There's the central nervous system, and then there's the peripheral nervous system. Now, the central nervous system is composed of the brain and the spinal cord. Now, the brain is an organ roughly about the size of a half of a loaf of bread. Okay, and um, it controls behavior. The spinal cord is a bundle of nerves about the thickness of a pencil and it runs down the length of your back and its primary function is to transmit messages between the brain and the rest of your body. The peripheral nervous system is made up of long axons and you'll see what that looks like pretty soon, these axons and dendrites and it specializes in four different divisions in s of sensory systems because your peripheral nervous system is all about the body's senses. So think fingertips and toes. There's the somatic division, the autonomic division, the sympathetic division, and then there's the parasympathetic division. The somatic division deals with the control of voluntary movements and the communication of information to and from the sense organs. The automatic division controls involuntary movement of the heart, lungs, glands, and other organs. The sympathetic division acts to prepare the body for action in stressful situations. This is your flight or fight response and it's tied to that division. This is when it is you feel like your body has to respond to a threat. So your heart rate will speed up. The parasympathetic division acts to calm the body after an emergency has ended. So your heart rate will lower, your sweating may stop and your breathing will come back to normal. So this is what a neuron looks like. The nervous system communicates by means of electrical signals or impulses that travel from uh, basically one neuron to another. These impulses travel from the neuron's dendrites, as you can see in this picture here, through the cell body, which is also known as the soma, and axon to the terminal buttons. The terminal buttons release chemicals called neurotransmitters and it's released into something called a synapse which is really just a space between uh, each neuron and they're sent to the dendrites of the adjacent neuron to transmit the impulse to the next neuron. Now I know that sounds like a mouthful and I probably confuse the heck out of you but think of it in terms as, as, as a long dance line and you're doing this break dance thing where it is you're doing that kind of a weave with your shoulders and your arms right think break dancing and then when it says you touch the other person the other person does the exact same thing with their hand and then they send it back to you sort of like that think of it as like a like a, an electrical impulse uh, that looks more like a dance between neurons from one neuron to the next one neuron is sending messages and the other ones receiving messages now once a neuron is in a normal resting state it'll have a negative internal electrical charge once a neuron is activated, its internal charge briefly becomes positive as an electrical impulse called an action potential. Well, what does all that mean? For example, if you were to touch something hot, what would happen is it's going to send that message directly uh, through your sensory neurons to your spinal cord which is then going to shoot that message to your brain. Your brain's going to receive that message that's going to tell you, oh, remove your hand, this is hot. You're burnt. That is an action potential. An action potential is generated only if the charge of the incoming impulse is sufficiently strong enough to cross the neuron's cell membrane and raise the neuron's charge to a level of plus 40 millivolts.
That means it has to be strong enough for you to detect it, for your brain to pick it up, for you to tell your body to do something. Neurons operate according to an all or nothing law. There's all or none. Either there's some type of, of, of impulse to create a charge or there's none. So either a neuron is at rest or resting potential or there's an action potential and it's moving through it so that there's no in-between state. Most impulses, of course, move in one direction, either away from or towards the brain or the spinal cord. So, for example, when we catch a ball, neurons in the hand send a signal to the brain telling the hand to do what's next. So there's quite a bit of things going on that we don't really think about uh, that's happening in the brain. And um, neurons are, are very important in that regard. Um, if you think of, of people with phantom limbs, okay, neurons in the brain have the ability to to adapt to each other and make up in another area where sensory information is lost. So for the person who doesn't have a limb, they're still able to feel sensations, even heightened sensations in other areas, such as in their cheek. Uh, there's um, a video on, on YouTube by Dr. Ramachandran. He's a well-known uh, neuroscientist that does some research with the phantom limb and his mirror box on, and visual feedback therapy, and it, it demonstrates this. All right, so let's talk parts of the brain. There are two hemispheres in the brain. There's the left hemisphere, um, and then there's the right hemisphere. The right hemisphere controls the left side of the body, and the left hemisphere controls the right side of the body. The corpus callosum is that region in between, okay, that holds everything together. It, it allows communication from one hemisphere to the other. It's a bridge of fibers passing information between the two cerebral hemispheres. Okay. Now, I asked a question earlier, can you live with half of a brain? There are some people who have had hemispherectomies, also colostomies, or, or severing of that corpus callosum. And uh, for some of those people, these are people who tend to experience multiple seizures per day. And it has to be really severe for a doctor to go in and remove part of their brain. Now, as you can see from the MRI scan, there's a picture on the left here that shows both hemispheres intact. And then there's a picture on the right that shows uh, a hemispherectomy or a removal of part of a, of a hemisphere. In this case, the removal of the left hemisphere does not necessarily mean that this person will die or cannot live. It just means that they might have some, or more than likely will have, some type of um, deficits on the right side of their body or with other areas, such as with language or comprehension or speech. Um, there's a number of things that can be affected on the left hemisphere uh, or as well as the right hemisphere or the rest of the brain that's remained can make up for whatever is lost. This is called brain plasticity or neuroplasticity. Before I talk about this, I'll tell you more. Neuroplasticity, um, we see this in plasticity of the brain in cases with people living with half a brain, you know, um, detached hemispheres, traumatic brain injuries. Um, another well-known one is an early case study of Phineas Gage who had a rod go through his brain. Um, their brain is able to sort of again make up for these deficits and repair itself. There's some research that's done on different parts of the brain that shows this. For example, if you have damage to your Broca area or Wernicke area, it can impact language. This, these are your language areas of your brain. So for someone who may have had temporary issues with speaking um, because they may have had some uh, traumatic brain injury, over time with therapy they may be able to speak maybe not as well as they did before, but uh, their speech may be intact as opposed to when they weren't speaking at all. So again, that's an example of this brain plasticity, or uh, rather uh, another term for it is neuroplasticity. This is where your brain undergoes constant alterations. Um, there's tons of, of uh, synaptic pruning going on and your brain in fact can repair itself with new connections and, and reorganize to, to adapt. Now there's a number of ways you can uh, you can look at brain, brain structure and brain function. If you want to look at the structure of a brain, you can do a CAT scan and, or an MRI. And that's going to allow you to see quite a bit of things. Um, if you have a blood clot in your brain or you've suffered a stroke, um, it's going to show up on the CAT or the MRI. 
Now, if you want to look at brain function, uh, you would do a functional uh, MRI or fMRI. This is something that where it is they'll have you um, do some type of an activity, like play a video game and see what part of your brain lights up. That's one thing. If you were to look at my brain right now with me talking, um, my language area is going to light, light up. That broker area is going to be on fire, <laughs> basically. Um, then you have the, the PET scan or the positron emission tomography, and then there's the EEGs. EEGs are quite common when they're looking at brain waves, especially when it is you sleep. And when we get to consciousness and states of consciousness, we talk about sleep. We'll talk about REM sleep, and you'll see what those, are, those spindles uh, in your brain looks like. Well, not in your brain, but, you know, at least in your text. We can't talk about the brain without talking about the different lobes. There's the frontal lobe. This is the last part of your brain to actually develop. As a matter of fact, if you're under the age of 25, that part of your brain is still developing. Um, this is where it is you do a lot of your higher order thinking, your organizing, uh, your executive functioning, your planning. Everything takes place there. This explains why so many teenagers uh, are involved in so many risk-taking activities. Um, as well as young college students as well under the age of 25 um, because that part of their brain is still developing so they're unable to make proper decisions and and especially take serious risks now does that mean if you're over 25 you won't take risks and you won't uh, do things um, normal or, or abnormal things from time to time uh, absolutely not there's a number of other factors that play into that as well there's the parietal lobe these receive and process sensory information um, taste, smell, sight, all of this stuff, uh, parts parts of sight is in your parietal as well. It depends on, on where, such as um, your fusiform gyra is there. Uh, fusiform gyra is for uh, recognizing faces, while your occipital lobe processes visual information. The fact that you're looking at this right now will make your occipital lobe light up because there's your visual pathways goes from your eye through your hypothalamus directly to your occipital lobe which I just said here, there's your visual information processing. Now your temporal lobe processes auditory stimuli and language. This is where your Wernicke area is. Your Wernicke area should be um, uh, posterior for your, to your temporal lobe and your Broca area anterior of your frontal lobe but in your temporal area. And then um, there's, there's the, um, the auditory senses, the fact that you can hear me. Um, again, is, is with your temporal lobe. This is the most developed part because you're hearing things even from within the womb. From the time you are in utero, you are exercising that part of your brain. Your temporal lobe is starting to build uh, rapid connections because of sound that you hear in utero. Now, when it comes to the limb limbic system, um, there are two main parts here. There are the amygdala and then there's the hippocampus. The hippocampus is responsible for memory. This is the, reg the region associated primarily with memory. The amygdala is a mass of, of nuclei associated with emotions, emotional behavior and motivation. Um, these two things are so close together in your brain that theorists believe that they are connected. This is why if you think about your earliest memory, chances are that memory will have some type of emotional substance to it, something tied to your emotions. This is why flashbulb memories are so important. Um, when we talk about memory, if we do happen to get to that chapter on uh, memory in this course, um, you'll learn about flashbulb memories and how emotions can in fact um, uh, create long-lasting memories that you rem remember forever like it was yesterday or uh, if you don't have the emotion you tend to forget so uh, the amygdala and the hippocampus again are interconnected it's a part in your brain um, a region in your brain that really are close to each other and seem to be working in cahoots with each other as well another thing worth mentioning is uh, this part of the brain is also affected by Alzheimer's disease this is why people with Alzheimer's tend to have so much issues with remembering things and as a result um, aren't able to form new memories or remember things from their past because this part of their brain is normally damaged uh, over time due to that degenerative disease. Now, the hypothalamus is located below the thalamus, maintains a constant internal environment within a healthy range, uh, helps regulate sleep-wake cycles, sexual behavior, and appetite. 
um, this is responsible for regulating basic biological needs, hunger, thirst, and then temperature control. The medulla is responsible for regulating uh, largely unconscious functions such as breathing and circulation, digestion, heart rate. All of these things are part of the medulla. And um, if your medulla was damaged, then of course you would have problem, uh, excuse me, prob problems, I'm, I'm mixing up problems and trouble. You would have trouble with these uh, functions. Now, the cerebellum, also known as uh, little brain, it's Latin for little brain, is responsible for muscle coordination. So what would happen if you had damage to your cerebellum? Well, naturally you would have uh, problems with balance and you'd struggle to walk. You'd have issues being um, able to to stand and uh, you know on your two legs without being all wobbly. There's been research that uh, shows this as well. People who it is have really small cerebellums uh, tend to walk on all fours because they're unable to stand and walk properly. And there's been again some case studies that controls bodily balance.